uh, good afternoon, colleagues. Welcome back to our conference sessions. Uh, I hope you had some resting and we have more energy now to proceed. Uh, we are now going to have our first plenary lecture, which is going to be given by Ms. Zainab Sheikh. Uh, Zainab is actually a winner of the Best Young Botanist Award at the last uh, annual sub conference, which was held in 2020. Uh, currently, she is a PhD candidate in the Department of uh, Biological and Environmental Sciences at the Gothenburg University in Sweden and a junior lecturer in plant genom genomics at Stellenbosch University, in South Africa. Uh, Zainab completed her bachelor's, honors, and master's degrees in the biological sciences at the University of Cape Town between 2013 and 2019. The MSc focused on um, species delineation and the speciation processes in the widespread morphological variables species complex uh, called uh, Serifium plumosum using massively parallel sequenced molecular data. After a MSc, Zainab completed a one-year internship in plant taxonomy at the Compton Herbarium at Sanby. A present research, which is supervised by Prof. Ben G. Oxel at, uh, I think, GU with the university name. Uh, then Prof. G. Anton Verbom at UCT and Dr. Nicola Berg at Sanby is focused on the a stool clade of uh, pepper diasis, a monophyletic group centered in the Cape floristic region, uh, encompassing approximately 70 recently speciated species in eight genera. The thesis work will address speciation mode in the clade, reconstruct a dated phylogen for the group using targeted enrichment markers captured using the Asteracea conserved orthologous probe set, which is cause uh, two. And more generally, we address the influence of molecular information content and migration on phylogenetic interference, where both incomplete lineage sorting and migration are explicitly modeled in the Bayesian multi-species coalescent based method, which is DENIM. So we are going to have a talk from her uh, on the topic which is uh, entitled uh, Spatially Explicit Tests of Species Independence Using Genome Scale Markers. So I present to you uh, Zainab Sheikh to give a talk. And uh, Zainab, welcome, and I leave the floor for you. Thank you. Thanks, Professor. Uh, and thanks to Saab for inviting me here. Uh, let me share my presentation. Mm, window. Okay, I believe everyone should be able to see this now. I hope so. Um, so yes, as Prof mentioned, um, I'm working at Stellenbosch University and I'm doing a PhD in Sweden. And the work that I'm gonna be presenting today um, is based on a publication that we submitted late last year. It was the subject of three years' work, um, and much of that was after my master's, so this is work that's been coming on a long time to try to understand uh, species limits in a group of daisies called Serifium plumosum. And um, specifically, uh, my interest in using spatial data uh, and massively parallel sequence markers for understanding species limits. So. I thought I'd begin with sort of first principles, understanding how uh, species have been described in the CAPE. The CAPE is my sort of system of interest. I work on a small group of daisies currently. Um, and accurately describing species is, of course, central to alpha taxonomy. We need to know what things are before we can begin to conserve them or research them further. And we know that uh, recent studies have shown that the majority of plant species that are still going to be described are probably going to be described in biodiversity hotspots like the Cape floristic region. It's the smallest and the richest hotspot in the world. 
We know that since the inception of taxonomy in the 15th century, uh, taxonomy has been primarily based on morphology. So we've used uh, the attributes that we can observe to define the populations that together constitute species. And that's still the way we describe most species today. We use a uh, phenotype-based uh, phenotype approach. But we also know that many species um, that will still be discovered uh, have little to no phenotypic differentiation. So in other words, they are uh, strongly genetically differentiated. They, quant they qualify as good species by other methods, but um, they're not morphologically uh, distinguishable but they still qualify species. So how do we go about describing them? These are some recent uh, discoveries in the Cape Floristic region. So in order to uh, accurately catalog species, including species which are cryptic or semi-cryptic, um, molecular data are increasingly being used to define those species, oftentimes alongside more traditional sources of taxonomic evidence. And so a good example is this work by Matthew Britton and other authors from 2014. Matthew Britton was also a student of Tony for Worms at UCT. Um, I did my master's under Tony for Worm. And together they found support for five uh, cryptic or semi-cryptic species in this high elevation sedge called Tetraria triangularis. And what's interesting about the species is that it's got a fairly large distribution. It's distributed uh, pretty much over the entire Cape Floristic region. Um, and that's really unusual for a Cape plant. Most Cape plants have narrow ranges, um, which a priori suggested that perhaps this, what, what's considered one species actually comprises multiple species. And so they collected uh, traditional Sanger sequenced markers, I think three or four uh, traditional Sanger markers. And they also collected morphological data for all of these populations. And what they found is that they could pull out these very distinct uh, groups of populations, which uh, each of which qualify as an independent species. And what's really fascinating, so at the bottom here, these two plots are discriminant functions. So based on the molecular data, they created a priori groupings, um, which they then ordinate in uh, three-dimensional space. Uh, well, in this case, two-dimensional. And you can see that when all the populations are plotted together, uh, the populations aren't coming out very strongly, but we can still we can still see the emergence of some distinct clusters. What's really fascinating is when we look at groups strictly in sympatry, so populations which exist uh, together, they co-occur, and when we look at those groups alone, we see that actually these groups are more strongly morphologically differentiated than groups that are allopatric. In other words, we see character displacement um, in sympatry. So, for me, this is a really beautiful depiction of the marriage of traditional sources of evidence with molecular data, really strongly pulling out these uh, very distinct groupings and help, helping us understand where species boundaries are. Um, so I'm gonna be presenting a few, a few studies that use molecular data in similar ways. Uh, the next one is by Peary and other authors, and they worked on this clade of ericas uh, where species boundaries between these ericas are unclear. Uh, and what they used to define species was non-sister relationships where sister relationships were expected. So if, for example, we think that two populations belong to the same species, but those two populations emerge on opposite ends of a phylogeny, uh, that in itself provides support for species independence, the, the independence of those two populations as separate species. So that's what they used as their standard for what a unique species is. Uh, Prunia and Holsinger used microsat data um, on multiple species of Protea. Uh, they stopped short of formalizing the groups that they recovered. And so they, they collected microsat data for a group of uh, Proteas mostly uh, centered in the Cape Floristic region. And they performed what's called a structure analysis, which is a fairly common analysis in population genetics and also in species delimitation increasingly. And what they found is that in Protea mundii, we see this very obvious east-west uh, distinction, a genetic distinction of populations which are geographically distinct as well. So these potentially qualify as being independent species. But also interestingly, we see that 
other species, Protea punctata and Protea venusta, emerge as being members of the same gene pool. So there could be an artificial division between these species because the genetic data suggests that they actually form part of one genetically cohesive entity. So as I mentioned, this is becoming increasingly common. We use structure-like analyses based on massively parallel data sets or microsat data uh, to define species which conform to the assumptions of Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium and of linkage, uh, linkage equilibrium. So this is a very specifically defined species, is a species uh, conforming to very specific kinds of assumptions. So I've shared examples with uh, Sanger markers and with microsat data, but increasingly we're seeing the applic uh, application of massively parallel sequencing markers uh, to understand the boundaries between species. And what's really great about this is that the per cost marker of a massively parallel sequence marker is much lower than for Sanger sequencing. We get uh, hundreds to thousands of markers and overall the project is more expensive. But if we divide the cost of the project by the number of markers that we obtain across the genome, the per marker cost is lower. And what's really great is that we don't need any reference information. We can construct a uh, genome um, de novo. So we don't need any, uh, we don't need the reference of the species or of a close relative to, to do this kind of sequencing. So in 2017, Pruny and other authors uh, looked at subspecific structure in Protea repens. It's probably the best known Protea because it's so widespread. Uh, the common name is Psychobosi. And uh, we can see, again, like Tetraria triangularis, it's got this unusually widespread distribution for a Cape plant. And again, these authors found evidence for multiple ancestral gene pools within what is currently considered to be a single genetically cohesive species. And they, I, I think this is the first application of massively parallel sequence markers in a Cape plant. So uh, structure here recovered support for two or three independent gene pools. So thus far I've spoken about discriminant functions being used to discriminate species and the emergence of um, accessions on opposite ends of a tree and also use of structure analyses for defining species. But over the last decade or so, um, we've seen increasingly the use of the multi-species coalescent model for defining species. Uh, the multi-species coalescent is, uh, it forms the basis for most uh, popular tree inference methods, including Astral, Starbeast, Best, BBB, Snap, etc. Um, and it's actually an extension of a, a model in population genetics. It was uh, called the N-coalescent. And um, that model uh, for population genetics helped us understand the way uh, genealogies uh, evolve backwards in time. So it's been extended to the species level uh, for inferring phylogenies, but it can also be used to delimit species that conform to a very specific set of assumptions called right fisher assumptions. Um, the right fisher model is just that. It's a very biologically unrealistic, but mathematically convenient model for, under, for defining species. And to give you an idea of the kind of species a right fisher species is, is it's a species that speciates instantaneously. So when two lineages begin to diverge, they are immediately well-defined. They don't exchange any genes after divergence, not even a little bit initially, they are instantly independent species. They're not subject to drift, they're not subject to selection. Um, this is a really, like I said, biologically unrealistic, but mathematically convenient way of defining species. And that's what the multi-species coalescent model defines. So these, these methods have really um, exploded in the last uh, 10 years, give or take, since the first initial models were developed. Um, and they use different forms of input data. So some of them use, uh, so BPP and Dissector Stacy uh, use full sequences. So multiple sequence alignments, and then base factor delimitation uses either full sequences or uh, single nucleotide polymorphism data, so single point mutations. Um, but what they have in common is that they all define right fisher species according to this very specific definition. And so uh, late last year, the manuscript that we submitted uh, 
we provided support for multiple independent species in Seraphium plumosum based on this method dissect or stacy which my swedish uh, professor actually was involved in developing and uh, these were the results of that uh, well the central results of that manuscript where we found support so so this is the the tree that dissect or stacy produces and then on the right side is what's called a dissimilarity matrix so this gives us the probabilities that accessions are supported as members of the same species. So of course we expect the diagonals to be black. Black here means the posterior probability of one, that two accessions belong to the same species. And white means a posterior probability of zero, that they belong to the same species. And we can see that only two accessions, accessions 44 and 30, I don't know if you can see this, it's quite small, but only 44 and 30 are supported as members of the same right fisher species and every other accession we we included 36 accessions every other accession is supported as being an independent species independent right fisher species i should say um, so i think you can see how this uh, contributes massively to taxonomic inflation if we were to actually describe each of these accessions as a separate species um, but what's really nice with this analysis is that we also get the tree so if you look at the tree, the clades that are supported with posterior probabilities of one are um, groups of populations which actually very nicely conform to more inclusive groups supported by structure-like analysis. So we we uh, applied a structure-like analysis called sparse non-negative matrix factorization using the same genome scale data set. And we see really amazing correspondence between the groupings or the gene pools recovered by SNMF um, and the clades recovered in the tree with posterior probability of one. So this is a, a little bit of a digression, um, but species limitation methods uh, like the one I just showed have been strongly criticized. Um, but the reality is that they identify species that maximally conform to the right Fisher assumptions and where these assumptions are poorly met, so where empirical data violate the assumptions of the model, the model will be expected to quote unquote misbehave. And in this case, misbehavior manifests as a systematic overestimate of the number of species that uh, the model will support. And so a few years ago, now 2017, Sukumaran and Knowles published this paper where they really strongly spoke against multi-species coalescent methods, and they say they delimit structure, not actual species. Um, and this paper was cited quite a lot. But yes, but that's exactly what they meant to do. <laughs> so um, Liche and other authors uh, published this sort of rejoinder in 2019, and they clarified that the multi-species coalescent model is designed to delimit species according to a very specific definition of species, and it does precisely that. Provided the conditions of the model are met, it will define right fisher species. But in any case, apart from all these issues, um, if we have a highly informative genome scale data set, we've invested all these resources, we've invested all the research money in obtaining these data, how else can we assess species limits in a group where species limits are uncertain? And um, Hausdorff and Hennig in 2020 made this observation that despite the fact that we collect spatial data where we collect genomic data, we seldom use those spatial data for understanding species limits. And so uh, they devised this set of hypotheses, uh, hypothesis tests to assess whether two species are uh, independent based on spatial data. So they published this paper called Species Delimitation and Geography, and they published a sister R package called PRABCLASS um, to implement the tests that they developed. So it's, it's all fairly automated. And their tests are based on Wright's 1943 theory of isolation by distance. It's a fairly common theory. I think everyone learns this in undergraduate biology where genetic differentiation is expected to be a positive function of uh, geographic distance in a context of spatially limited dispersal. So this is precisely what we see among most plants where uh, gene flow in the form of seeds and pollen 
uh, are concentrated around the parent plant. And then we have very limited incidences of uh, long range dispersal. So the pattern overall is leptokurtic, where the vast majority of gene flow happens nearby. And then you have these isolated instances of far distance dispersal. So the assumptions uh, or, or the expectations in Hausdorff and Hennig's tests are very simple. If two species are conspecific, then a single isolation by distance plot should fit both of them. Because if two putatively independent species are actually one cohesive species, uh, they should behave like a genetically cohesive community in space. But if the two species are indeed distinct, if they are two independent species, then that we expect that there should be two independent If you look at uh, an example of two putatively independent species, these are actually independent species in reality. But let's assume that we have some a priori evidence that these two species are potentially actually one species. So what we could do is collect some um, genetic information from across the species distribution and plot geographic distance, in this case in kilometers, against genetic distance, in this case FST. And as you can see, the expected trend is emerging for both species. We see a fairly linear relationship between geographic and genetic distance. And again, to reiterate, the expectation is that if these two species are genetically independent, so in other words, if they're not communicating genetically, if they're not exchanging genes, then the amount of distance between them shouldn't be related to the amount of genetic differentiation between them. It doesn't matter if they're separated by two kilometers or 2000 kilometers. If they're not communicating genetically, then like distance doesn't matter. They're, those two factors should be uncorrelated. So before I get to the actual um, tests, let's look at what the data actually look like. And as input data, we need two different uh, distance matrices. The first is a genetic distance matrix. This is based on Weir and Cockerham's uh, FST. It's a slight deviation on Wright's FST. And then a geographical distance matrix. And in this instance, we have three populations sampled from each of two species. And we ha so I've, I've uh, put these colored boxes which correlate with, with the words at the bottom. So in the red box, in both matrices, we have distances between populations within species one. In gray, on the bottom right-hand side, we have distances between populations within species two. And then in green, we have distances between populations uh, in species one and two. And for geographic distance, that's fairly easy to visualize. So if we imagine this blue landmass occupied by these two putatively independent species of uh, gray and red beetles, the red distances are between red beetles, the gray distances are between gray beetles, and then the green lines is every possible combination of distances between red and gray beetles, if that makes sense. So. Before we get into the actual test again, how do we define geographic distance? So FST is fairly easy to calculate. You provide a matrix of molecular data and you, there's many different ways of uh, estimating genetic distance using different uh, measures. I've just used FST. But how do we define geographic distance? So um, recent uh, work by for Boehm and other authors have shown that numerous Cape lineages have uh, soil or elevation defined niches. So they can't actually, they don't actually disperse in straight lines. They disperse according to where they can disperse. And um, I struggled with this problem when I was looking at my own isolation by distance plots for plants that are distributed like this in the Cape Floristic region in the Cape Pole Belt Mountains. Uh, if you're familiar with the Cape, you know that we have these three major arms of the Cape Floristic region. Um, the first of these north-south trending parts of the belt, and then uh, the east-west trending part of the range, and then the southwestern corner where these two arms coincide. So th this mountain range in sort of an L shape. And 
I was really frustrated when I was looking at my molecular data because uh, distance and uh, genetic, differen uh, genetic difference were not correlated and I couldn't understand why. And I realized that's because plants are not dispersing like a straight line here. They're actually dispersing in an L shape. They, they don't occur in this region. So they, because they're only dispersing through the mountains, we should only consider that to be like a possible avenue for transport. Uh, of, of genes. So instead of using chord distances or distances as the crow flies, it's probably better to use least cost paths. And you can do that quite nicely in an R package called topo distance. This has also fairly recently been published. And you can compute them and then visualize them in space as well. So this is a very simple least cost path uh, landscape. You can see the faint gray outline. That's the extent of this, this Southern African landmass. And then the green is uh, areas above 200 meters elevation. So this is a very simple landscape where we say uh, plants can only uh, disperse, but genes can only move in space along the green parts because we can say, for example, these plants don't occur under 200 meters elevation. So it doesn't make sense for them to move genes in that way. And we can visualize how uh, those populations could be exchanging genes in space. But we can also refine these layers so that the cost of dispersal is a function of species distribution. In other words, we make transport easiest where plants are most concentrated based on uh, species occurrence. And so you can see, uh, in this case, I've used elevation to define uh, where dispersal is easiest. And with every increase in 200 meters elevation, uh, dispersal is easier by 20%. So conductance is highest here at one, uh, above a thousand meters elevation. And you can see once you start to refine this conductance landscape, dispersal lines become less straight. They become a little bit more nuanced. And the paths that uh, genes are taking are preferentially over higher elevation areas where these plants occur. We can also do the inverse. And so, for example, if you have coastal species which are confined to a specific coastal substrate, you can say, well, these plants can only move where they actually occur on very specific kinds of substrates. So, for example, these populations on extreme ends, they, they're taking a much longer path along the coast, but that's because that's a more realistic depiction of where they can actually disperse. They, they can't disperse overland. So back to the two types of matrices we have. Um, and in the single slide, I'm going to be explaining Hausdorff and Hennig's three tests. And this is where things get a little bit hairy. So I'm going to go quite slow because I also um, really struggle to understand <laughs> the logic behind these tests when I first read the paper. But it really is quite intuitive once, once you uh, think about it. So there's three tests. And uh, they're called H1, H2, and H3. And depending on the outcome of H1, you either do H2 or H3. So it's like a decision-making tree, basically, that you pass through. So the first test is very simple. It says, are the regression lines for two species significantly different? So when you create an isolation by distance plot, a plot of distance against uh, genetic distance for two species, are the two regression lines significantly different? In other words, are the intercept and the slope estimates significantly different? If the answer is no, you move on to H2, which asks, can the between group distance and the two species be modeled by a common regression line? So in this case, uh, the red line and the red triangles, that's the IBD plot for the first species. The black circles and the black line are the IBD plot for the second species. And then these green crosses are the genetic and geographical distance between the two species. So um, if I go back to the one, the, the slide with the beetles on it, that's these distances, the distances between rather than within species. Mm, yeah. So. If, uh, if they can't be modeled by a single line, then you have support for species independence. But if not, you don't have any evidence that these two species are in fact uh, different. They, there's no evidence that they 
uh, are independent genetic communities. The alternative is that uh, the regression lines between the species uh, are significantly different, in which case you go on to hypothesis test three. So in this case, we can't model the red and the black with a single isolation by distance line. The, the slope and the uh, intercept estimates are significantly different. So now we ask, OK, since they are significantly different, can we at least model the green crosses with either the red line or the black line? And again, there are two outcomes here. If the answer is no, then there's no support for species independence. But if the stippled red line and the stippled black line uh, can model the distribution of these green crosses, the between species distances, then again, we have support for species independence. So it's fairly straightforward. Um, I had to read the paper like five times <laughs> to actually understand the logic behind it, but it really is uh, pretty elegant once, once you get it. So we applied these tests to our work on Seraphium. Uh, like I shared before, we applied uh, structure-like analyses, we applied dissect and stacy, and as a sort of independent source of evidence, we also applied these spatial tests. And we found support for most uh, species comparisons, we found support for species independence. This is kind of one of the cons of this approach, is that you can only uh, compare two species at a time. Um, but yeah, overall, we, we had really nice support for species independence. So in the last two slides, I'm going to be speaking a little bit about the cons of this approach. Uh, I'll speak about cons first and then pros. Um, the first is that as a user, you need to define what your candidate species are a priori. So if you think two species might be independent, you need to actually have evidence for that. Why do you think these two specific sets of populations are independent? And whatever your results are, the quality of your inference is only as good as your evidence for supporting those two species as independent in the first place. So if, if you have bad a priori information about where species limits are, the quality of your inference is going to be affected. The other thing is uh, that the relationship between genetic and geographic distance must be linear, or at least you must be able to transform your data in some way to achieve linearity. Your inability to detect significance may be because you haven't sampled enough populations. Um, and then also computational reasons. So in the tests that I showed, so in these ones that we included in our manuscript, we used populations as points, but um, it's much more powerful to use individuals in populations as points. So we sampled six individuals in each uh, population, which would have meant increasing the number of points in our analysis sixfold, and that would have meant much more computational power needed. So. Um, there is a computational challenge in calculating something like FST for a big genetic distance matrix. And then I also found that Pride Plus was quite buggy. Um, I had another student, um, another MSE student who was using this also, and we both had real problems doing very simple things like increasing the size of a point is really not uh, easy. So a lot of these I ended up doing manually because the package is pretty buggy. But even so, I think the pros massively outweigh the cons. Uh, the most important pro that I can see is that this approach is logically decoupled from coalescent species delimitation. So you're using the same molecular data set, but you're using it in a different way so that your, uh, your decisions on species limits are not like uh, pseudo replicative. You're, you're using the same data set, but in a methodologically independent way. And you can use the same data set, but have uh, stronger support for species independent because your approach has, is, is different. And then geographic data are nearly almost uh, always available. So it's easy to implement. So instead of why, why not? The whole, the whole testing procedure is automated in Prab class. So it's, it's fairly easy to implement. Really, why not if you have the data? And also, as I showed with uh, species with specific distributions, if species are not linearly distributed, uh, 
you can fix nonlinearity by using conductance distances with least cost paths rather than using code distances. Thank you. I think I should, I guess I should stop sharing. Thank you very much, uh, Zena. It's, it's quite an exciting and uh, interesting talk. And we are also happy to have you here as a, 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 a previous winner, also the latest winner of uh, this conference. And we are under the young, the young presenters. Uh, I think I would also wish you the best in your PhD. The work is quite <laughs> Yes. Thank you. That's fine. So I, I can invite some few questions if there's anyone wants to ask a question so that you can answer maybe one or two because I see we still have about 10 minutes. Thank you. Any question from anyone? You can raise your hand, then we can give you a chance to ask a question. I think my, my technical team can also assist me in identifying anyone who is uh, willing to ask a question so that we maybe sign up and answer one question before she leaves. It looks like there's no question. Maybe the presentation was clear and good. <laughs> but, uh, I don't need to ask any questions, but it was quite exciting. Thank you very much for your time. And Thanks for having me. All the best. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, colleagues. Uh, now we are going to take a small comfort break uh, between now and uh, one o'clock so that when we come back, we now get into our parallel sessions. Thank you very much. <laughs>